to be quiet. Thank you. Mr. Hughes? Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. As I understand it, Mr. Hughes, you are taking 10 minutes, and Mr. Bellillo will have five minutes. Yes, thank you, Chief Justice Marshall, members of the Supreme Judicial Court. The plaintiffs in this case are uh, Catherine Maffey and her daughter Maureen, who are with us in the courtroom today, and Eileen Hannafin. Can I, can I clear up something at the outset? Your theories in this case don't, don't involve the issue that's going on in some other jurisdictions about church property, namely who owns the property, the parishioners or the archbishop. This involves straight old common law principles of constructive trust, resulting trust, breach of contract, and misrepresentation. Am I right? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you. Um, for a brief statement of the case, this case was begun in June of 2005 by the plaintiffs. The Maffey plaintiffs were suing uh, as a result of a transfer of property for $12,000 in 1946 on the assurance that would always be used uh, as a church in honor of James Maffey. Could, could I just ask you about that? They, they dated the property to the church. It was a deed for con which for consideration the, the, paid. Did the deed reflect any conditions or restrictions or anything like that? The deed was simply for consideration paid. And they got a fair uh, compensation for the property? I refer uh, this court to exhibit number seven of the exhibits. It is a letter from uh, then Pastor Robert H. Lord to the Chancellor where he states that I am getting $12,000 for this property. My uh, direct uh, advisor is the chairman of the Board of Appeals, and he says that property in this area generally goes for $2,000 an acre. This is $1,500 an acre. A, a piece, an acre right across the street just went for $2,400, and he agrees that this is a really cheap price. But isn't, doesn't this case really boil down to, as Justice Island suggested, whether there was a condition to the giving of the gift. I mean, isn't that it? And whether the church agreed to these conditions. I suggest that this case is principally brought under the uh, con uh, theories, uh, the Maffey case, of implied trust and constructive trust. And that under implied trust and constructive trust, in the implied trust cases, it states that in the deed, it's in the uh, written documents and the attendant circumstances. I suggest the attendant circumstances could be no more persuasive than in this case as to a specific use. Mr. H uh, Mr. Hughes, in order for us to reach the question of implied trust, do we have to conclude that there was a special relationship between um, your client and her sibling and Reverend Lord? Well, if there's a the implied trust or the constructive trust. On the constructive trust, there has to be what is uh, determined a relationship of trust and confidence. Right. Okay. Yes. And uh, in the supplemental brief that I filed in other jurisdictions, they have filed, found an absolute fiduciary duty in these circumstances, even where it reaches contracts. In, in Massachusetts, there is no per se fiduciary relationship. However, if there's not a per se fiduciary relationship, a factual determination can be f determined whether or not there is a relationship of trust and confidence. I suggest Saying that... Saying there was a fiduciary relationship between the priest who negotiated, if that's the right word, this transfer in the plaintiffs? I'm, not, uh, I'm saying that there was a factual, there's a factual issue, as this was determined on summary judgment. That there could be a, a fiduciary factual, relationship? That there was a trust, there was a relationship of trust and confidence. But weren't they on opposite sides? I mean, I, I, it's, a buyer and a, it's like a buyer and a seller. It, it? I suggest that the facts of these cases are far, far more cognizant of a partnership than a buyer or a seller. Well, as, no, wait a minute. A relationship of trust and confidence is a fiduciary relationship. Yes. To get involved in that, we're going to be interfering directly in church doctrine, polity, governance, and everything else about the relationship between a priest and his parishioners. And courts just don't get into that. Well, I suggest in the supplemental brief, many courts have. I suggest well, also. I suggest they're wrong if they're doing oh, that. I suggest that well, I think in, in charitable giving, charitable giving is to a, uh, a religion quite often. If there's a charitable gift to a church, they have to play by the same rules, the same rules that uh, uh, apply to everybody else. And here there was uh, representations, there was an agreement. And this was a transfer of land, a transfer of land to build a church. 
Without land, churches isn't, can't isn't be the built. Glove, isn't the essence of your claim, Mr. Hughes, the following, which is that if it were a true um, arm's length negotiation, um, for all kinds of reasons it concerns real estate, there's a statute of frauds, you know, this property could be sold to somebody else and they don't know about any of these outside the, outside the deed, um, you know, essentially limitations on the use of the property. Your, your argument is that there are cases that have said that the fact that somebody, that, that in those circumstances, such as the one that existed here, the, the person, Reverend Lord in this case, or the First Circuit had a similar case, they should be represented by independent counsel. They weren't represented by independent counsel because they relied on the confidence that they had placed in this person. Positively. And the earmarks that, that of the reliance are right in this uh, letter to which I referred to of Reverend Lord, where he says that we're getting a really cheap price. These people have promised to contribute towards the church. In fact, Waldo Maffey, they had, he had met twice with Reverend Lord, with Catherine uh, present, in their living room, he had said no twice. The third time, he said, what if we name it after my father? But be then he said, we have to have money for the four brothers. But the archdiocese knew Waldo Maffey was not getting paid any of the consideration. The archdiocese depended on Waldo Maffey, a very leading member of the Wellesley Native community, to be the pillar of this church, what he was. Waldo Maffey, who did not get a, a dime, out of this consideration, which the Archdiocese knew, contributed $10,000 towards this church, was the pillar of this church since it uh, started. How is that relevant? It is relevant in determining the attendant circumstances as to whether or not there was a specific gift under an implied trust for a church or whether it was a general contribution. I cannot conjure... How, how, how do subsequent contributions to the church that was ultimately built have anything to do with the transfer of the property? Because it was the understanding... If one reads the letter, it refers to contributions by the Maffey family. And in Catherine Maffey's statements and in the, uh, and in the uh, allegations of the complaint, it was agreed at, prior to this uh, transfer taking place that not only would this transfer be, would be made, but that Waldo Maffey would support this church. And we did it. So it was. It was. In so if he hadn't done that, that would have been a breach of contract between Maffey and the church, and he could have been required to make additional contributions. No, but it certainly would have been less uh, compelling a case of a specific interest, a specific use, if he hadn't done it. Where someone agrees going in to do this, that it's going to be used as a church and used as a church in the name of their father, and that over the following 50 years of his life he lives this every week and supports this church. And when he dies, that at the suggestion of the pastor, a scholarship is made in his name. I cannot conjure up a more compelling case of a specific use. I think it seems to me, Mr. Hughes, that at very least there was an understanding that to the extent that this property was used as a church, it would be named after the father. What appears to be missing, and that's when there's this sort of foray off into canon law, is was there an understanding or anything else that the property could never, ever be um, sold or used for any other purpose? I suggest... That's, and that's a very... Um, I mean, Mr. Maffey presumably was not an unsophisticated person. I'm not talking about whether or not he knew that under canon law... Uh, it's not a question of canon law. It's if I enter into, you know, any kind of, uh, you know, understanding um, with somebody with whom I clearly have a relationship um, of trust and confidence, your claim essentially is that in perpetuity this property can be used only for the church. Correct? I suggest two things, that it could only be used or that it should have been done as a trust for the use of a church. There, were no, there was no lawyer hired by the Maffeys, which they understood. At the same time, the Maffeys had hired a lawyer for the estate. They did it simply because, at that time, people considered the word uh, of a clergyman better than a but, written instrument. My question is, what's the nature of the word of the clergyman? I don't think that, that the clergyman is saying, assuming, there is a, assuming that there is a relationship 
of trust or may even be a fiduciary relationship. Assuming that there is, I don't think that Reverend Lord was saying forever and forever and forever this property will be used as a church. Well, Reverend Lord said this will forever, in which he, was the words, will forever be used, uh, will, will, it will forever be a tribute to your father, James Maffey. They understood it to be that it would forever be a church. They perhaps, obviously, <clears throat> Reverend Lord, who was a vice rector at St. John's Seminary and uh, as stated, a uh, historian, had better knowledge of canon law than, than did the Maffeys. He knew all like that although it, churches weren't suppressed at the time, it was possible that it could be suppressed someday. But is it, is it your position that if, if the, the bishop had renamed another church in Wellesley to St. James the Great, uh, it could have then sold this property and used it for other purposes? No, my position is that as the Reverend Lord said in that letter which I referred to, the only site for this church is this eight-acre parcel, then it follows that the only use of this eight-acre parcel is as a church. It was done at a reduced price. It was done with the knowledge of the Ma in the agreement of all sides that the Maffies would be the uh, bulwark of that church. They, 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 were, they did so. The value of this property today is not because of anything that the archdiocese did. The value of this property today is the raw land, the raw land that the Maffies deeded and, uh, and at, at a reduced price. And in justice, it should be returned to them if the archdiocese determines that it does no longer want to be part of this trust and no longer conduct it as a church. Thank you, Mr. Hughes. Thank you. Mr. Bellieri? Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court. I was assigned uh, the issue of the statute of frauds and uh, I'd like to begin by uh, impressing upon the court that this is an unusual set of circumstances. What we have is a deed. We do not have a purchase and sale agreement. We do not have a contract or a bill of sale. And in the deed, all we have is the statement for consideration paid. Now, there certainly is a body of, of authority dating back to 1894 that stands for the proposition that you are not precluded from introducing extrinsic or parole evidence to explain the terms in a deed for consideration paid. And I understand that the rationale behind that is that normally you have a contract for the sale of real estate or for the conveyance, and you will normally would have a purchase and sale agreement where you'd find those terms, but we just don't have those in, these, in this case. And it is my uh, position, and I hope your honors accept that position that given the circumstances, both the fact of uh, our allegations made in the brief, but the circumstances related to Miss Maffey and her family and her reliance uh, on the, uh, on the uh, archdiocese and this conveyance, that it is terribly unfair to come down with a result that would bar her from submitting her case and her position to the jury. Now, certainly, there is parole and extrinsic evidence that is being relied on in this case to explain what for consideration paid means. You've heard explanations of $12,000, a monetary figure, being provided. That certainly is parole or extrinsic evidence. It is certainly not contained in any purchase and sale agreement or contract. Yet, the defendants elect to choose the statute of frauds and, and use it as a sword to slice between what it is that we propose the additional consideration is and what the extrinsic and parole evidence that would be introduced at trial would establish was the monetary consideration. And we are left with an extremely unfair situation. We are left with Ms. Maffey being barred access to a jury. We are left with circumstances. I have a tendency to be, have tunnel vision because of my practice. I envision a jury sitting having heard all the case, all the facts in the case and returning a judgment in favor of Ms. Maffey, but Ms. Maffey being precluded from that judgment simply because we choose to elect to slice the consideration in half uh, 
and allow parole and extrinsic evidence to come in on the monetary consideration, but not on the promises that we allege were made as additional consideration. So we have an unusual set of circumstances. We have only a deed. That is all we have. And I'd urge you to accept that in circumstances such as this, when a transaction occurs some 58 years ago, in circumstances where there's a reliance, and I think it's a justifiable reliance, on the representations made by the church to a very, very devout family, that under those circumstances, it is fundamentally unfair to allow extrinsic evidence and parole evidence to come in regarding a monetary payment, but to use the statute of frauds to just slice down the middle <coughs> and suggest that summary judgment must be awarded, that Ms. Murphy should be precluded access to the court and to the jury, and that even were a jury to decide that a judgment in her favor was justified, that she cannot have that judgment. I rest on the remainder of the arguments related to the fraud and the misrepresentation that is contained in the brief. I think in and of those well, can I just ask you one question, please? What yes. If, what if um, the church had been blown up by terrorists at some time? Would the church be obligated to rebuild it at its own expense? Well, I think they would have to at least, uh, in all fairness, I think, uh, the interpretation would have to be given that it would have to be used uh, for the purposes of worship. And it would have to be used in in the terms of what the expectation was of Ms. Murphy and Mr. Murphy in transferring the property and the promises made. So your answer so, would be yes? I, I, I would suspect yes. I'm not, I wouldn't suggest to you that they have to build the exact same church. I think they would have to build some type of house of worship, a facility for worship, and I think consistent with their promises, it would have to be named in, the, in honor of Ms. Murphy's father. Absolutely. There's no question about that. Thank you, Mr. Belial. Thank you. Mr. O'Connor. Thank you, Your Honors. Good morning. Uh, may it please the Court. Uh, my name is Francis O'Connor. I'm here for the appellee, Roman Catholic Archbishop of Boston Corporation, Seoul. With me is uh, Mark Rogers from our office as well. <coughs> The Superior Court, Your Honors, entered summary judgment in this case because it was appropriate and right to do as a matter of law. <clears throat> if I can first address the issue on the statute of limitations brought up by Mr. Bolero. Fraud. Statute of fraud. Statute of frauds, excuse me. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. The statute of frauds issue, this was a sale of land. Uh, Mr. Mr. O'Connor, let me ask you this. There's no question that as to a third party, right, you know, I, I want to buy the land and I um, – this has nothing to do with succession. Just go with me with the hypothetical. I want to go buy the land. I've heard that, uh, they, that you know, the people who have uh, right to this land might be interested in selling one or several properties, and so I approach them, and without involving the Maffies, uh, there's, a, there's a sale and a, a new deed is recorded. No question that for statute of fraud purposes, land purposes, all those kinds of things, no claim against a third party. But if I, for example, uh, own land and my next-door neighbor wants it, and um, my next-door neighbor says, I promise you I'm not going to build on it, right? That's a, that's a, that's a promise uh, between me and my neighbor, um, and um, we don't want to, you know, for, what, for whatever reasons, it's not written into the deed. And then my neighbor, while I'm still there, starts to build. Don't I have a cause of action against my neighbor? Uh, I mean, I may not be asking to get the land back. It, it sounds, Your Honor, a, a lot like the facts and circumstances in the Nazarella v. Peck case. I don't have the exact site, but it is right. cited in the briefs where the neighbors of the farmland agreed that one would purchase the other's land, for, uh, neighbor's land for as a straw and then convey it back to the other. In the first instance... No, this is not a straw. This is just an agreement saying, I'll, I'll sell you the land. We don't, we don't want to encumber it because I'm selling it to you, maybe for slightly less consideration, with the understanding that you won't build on it. You won't build on it. Well, Your Honor, in this particular case, I would say that in, in the, the uh, Maffey case, this land was uh, deeded in 1946. No, I know it's deeded in 1946, but, but in my case, 
the, the, it's deeded in 1946, and you don't build. I'm still alive. You don't build for 55 years, and then after 55 years, you start to build. I don't know what the relief is, right? I don't know what the relief is, but can't I sue you and say, we had a promise? We had a promise. Well, if you, if you, if you, uh, uh, I, I would say no. I'd say that it was barred by the statute of frauds that it, that it was not included um, in any of the transaction. And you're as a, as a third are party. There no, are there no real estate cases where we haven't admitted parole evidence to show some kind of side agreement? If there's been parole evidence in terms of an ambiguity in the deed, Your Honor, in this particular case, we're talking about an arm's length transaction that has no ambiguity. You're talking about everything is recited and set forth for considerable consideration in this case. Um, and if you look, Your Honor, as to whether or not this was a sale or a gift, Waldo Maffey had only a one-sixth interest in this property. There are five other siblings that right. are not part no, of this I'm, case. No, I'm aware of that. And they, the, the, the transaction took place after negotiating because the brothers wanted money for the land. They didn't want to give the land. You may be able to resolve this case on the statute of frauds, but isn't a much simpler answer to the effect that you've got a straightforward deed here that was given by all these folks uh, for fair, perhaps low, but fair consideration with no condition attached to it that would evoke doctrine of trust or anything else, that any claim of fiduciary relationship between these folks and the vice rector, whoever he was that wrote the letter uh, or talked to them about the transfer, would get us directly into canonical law where, where we can't go. So adding that all up, you've got a straightforward deed, and that's the end of that. That's been the position of, of the defendant in Pali, Your Honor. And, and that is exactly what happened here. It was a straightforward purchase, this condition, whichever occurred afterwards. And I, and I cite uh, the uh, province, Board of Selectmen of Provincetown versus the Attorney General, which, which Your Honor wrote, uh, uh, regarding uh, uh, the differences between uh, uh, what's recited in the deed and the, in, in you, the Your Honor made a, a uh, uh, explanation of fee simple determinable versus fee simple uh, condition to uh, subsequent subject to condition subsequent and uh, that in that particular case that uh, the oral gift uh, the court made particular note had to be as far as the transaction goes for the real estate had to be made with precision in this particular case you have a simple deed in its four corners it's unambiguous if if plaintiff's argument is that there's a reverter or a conditions uh, subsequent no, I think plaintiff's argument is you've got a con you've got a deed but there was some other agreement, as I say. I don't know what the relief is, but there is some other agreement. There is some other agreement yeah, that they're touches. Not, they're that not touches. arguing about uh, real property law in terms of reverters and defeasances and all that kind of thing. They're, they admit they're arguing constructive trust and resulting trust. That's what they're arguing, and misrepresentation, which we haven't talked about today, but so far. In That's terms, what they're arguing. They're not arguing reverters and all well, that. Well, they, they did ask for that in, in their relief, Your Honor, as far as re, they wanted a reverter. The, the, well, the, the damage, the, the, the two sets of things. One is do they, do they have standing? I think there's no serious challenge to that. The question is what's their legal claim? And their legal claim appears to be there's a deed, but there were some side agreements. I'm not even sure that you have to get to constructive trust. Well, Your Honor, I, I would say that, that you, could, you could decide agreements are not enforceable or legally binding as against the transaction for the real estate. The fact that if, uh, in, in, in arguing in the light most favorable to uh, the plaintiff, if uh, Reverend Lord or Father Lord said at the time, like, it's our intention to always use this, this as a church, that's not a legally binding promise to always use it as a church. It certainly could have been his intent at the time, but it wasn't any type of fraud, undue influence, or misrepresentation by Father Lord. It was the, the transaction that took place at the time. There was no misrepresentation as to, uh, as to that aspect at all. Um, and it goes to the intent at the time uh, the transaction occurred, which was, the, uh, I believe, cited in the Dwyer v. Dwyer cases. It takes place when we're talking about res resulting or constructive test. It, it has to occur at the time of the transaction. Uh, I, I just went back to check, and I, I think my memory is correct that the, they do make some claims with respect to the property, but they also make damage claims. Correct. I mean, in other words, assuming that there was a side agreement, one damage claim may be for the difference in the real estate, what they, what they could have sold it for. In other words, it may not be 
the issuance of villas pendants or getting title to the deed again if you can prove a side agreement. And they seem to have alleged that there was a side agreement, namely that this property would always be used for the church. Well, I, again, Your Honor, I'd, I'd point to that it's not legally binding, but also to look at the record. We're talking about an exhibit. I think it's Exhibit 11 mm -hmm. that talks about Mary Maffey. Now, Mary Maffey, according to the plaintiff, was also in the same position as Waldo Maffey, that she was gifting the land to the church. Uh, Mary Maffey, who is the executrix of the estate of James Maffey, from which this land uh, came from. She was the uh, daughter, correct? Excuse me? She was the daughter? She, she was, was the daughter. She was the daughter. She was children. Walter's brother. Yeah, yeah. Uh, she writes to the church uh, several years later, and she says specifically, and you'll see in that exhibit, we sold this land to you uh, several years ago. We have some more land abutting it. Would you like to buy it? No mention of a gift, no mention of, of uh, any condition on the prior sale whatsoever. Again, the, the, the plaintiff talks well, that, about... That, that, that may be a good argument for a jury. The question is, you know, viewed in its light most favorable to the plaintiff, have they made out a claim that there was a side agreement? I don't believe so, Your Honor, and I, I'd like to point out to the court that these were cross motions for summary judgment on all counts, and that's reflected in um, Judge... Uh, Smith's decision at the Superior Court level is also reflected in the record appendix that the, the issues as far as the facts and all of the uh, uh, materials that were going to be brought out, including uh, a statement taken by the plaintiff w without uh, uh, defense counsel present uh, of Catherine Maffey, which is also, uh, I think, Exhibit 25 in the exhibits, that sets forth all of the transaction. And none of the issues, if you are even to believe everything that they say with regard to Father Lord's statements, rises to the level that binds and obligates the, the uh, Roman Catholic Archbishop of Boston, a corporation sold, to hold this land in trust forever as a church. It's not stated in the deed. And all of the cases that, we've, that have been before this court and before the appeals court that talk about these types of restrictions and, and conditions on gifts, for example, the Hillman case versus the Roman Catholic Bishop of Fall River, the Fortin case versus Worcester, uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, Fortin case versus Fall, uh, Arch, uh, Roman uh, Catholic Bishop of Fall River. Mr. Mr. O'Connor, excuse me, for, for, for the last pieces of your argument, are you talking about Ms. Hanafi or, or Maffey? I'm talking about Maffey. Okay. Are we going to touch at all on Hanafi? If you would like, Your Honor, I could, address, I could address Mrs. Hannafin's claims, and, and they're specifically a negligent misrepresentation claim, that at the time Father Vasilis had solicited uh, donations to the church to her uh, for use for the church, that she gave a donation of approximately $35,000 at that time. And by Mrs. Hannafin's own admission in, that, uh, uh, in the case, Your Honor, was that, that that money was actually used by St. James Church for the purposes which he donated. There was painting, there was renovations, there, was, there were repairs done in the church. In, in the defendant's position is when it accepted the gift and, uh, from Ms. Hannafin, it used it for the intent for which it was given. Ms. Hannafin is obviously disgruntled at the closing of St. James Church and wants to change that issue or get her gift back because it closed. I don't think there's legal precedent or standing for her to be able to come forward and say that. What's, that would the, be what's the time the between General. the date of the gift and the date of the, of the closing, not the actual closing, but when the, when the notice was given? I, I think it was a, a period of one or two years. Okay, thank you. Um, and what did Father V say to her? I call him V. Uh, uh, Father Vatsalis. Yeah, thanks for the, thank you for the gift. We'll use it to keep the church going now and in the future. Wasn't that the statement? Right, right. And I think at the time, in terms well, of. How does that amount to, well, yes. And how does that amount to a misrepresentation? Future? It does not. Opinion? Pretty vague promise? Sort of a vague promise? It does not. And it also, it, it also reflects, Your Honor, that that was the intent of Father Vatsalis at the time, and nobody's disputing that. Well, did, did the priest know at the time that there was a, a possibility that, or, or that the, there was consideration being given to the closing of the church? It, specifically as to consideration to St. James, I don't believe so. In fact, I think there, there, well, there's... What does the record show? Is there anything well, in the record at all that shows he knew or might have known that they could close the church? I think there's some allegations by the plaintiff. I think the record in terms of Ms. Hannafin... What allegations? What have you got for... What have they got for evidence? I, I don't think they have evidence in terms of... Ms. This is summary judgment. This is Correct. not... And viewed, in the light, and viewed in the light most favorable to them. He's clearly an agent, isn't he? Well, again, it, it, 
the, he, if he's an agent, Your Honor, I, I, I don't dispute that for purposes of this record, but in terms of the but negligent isn't misrepresentation. It true there is no actual evidence that he had any knowledge, direct or indirect, that this church might get closed at that point. On this record, that's correct. Is in there fact, even he any told Ms. Hannafin. evidence Hannifin's that the church as a body had knowledge that this particular parish would be closed? No, I think, and in, in, in if you go back to the circumstances at the time, Your Honor, and I think dating all the way back to 2001, is the church was in a financial crisis, but no particular churches were designated for closure. In fact, they hadn't even gone through this cluster process that you may no, have heard about publicly. No, we're talking public. about evidence in the record, and I'm asking None. if there's any evidence in the record that the church as a body, as an organization, had discussed closing this church. No, there is not any evidence in the record of that, Your Honor. In fact, again, pointing to the uh, representation of Father Vasilis, that was indeed his intent at the time, and it did, in fact, use the gift for the purpose for which it was given. Uh, in terms of, Your Honor had mentioned the issue about standing, and in terms of uh, this particular issue, in terms of a reverter that they've asked for for damages, that type of thing is one of the issues for damages. That cannot stand in terms of not only the statute of frauds, but also in terms of uh, Mass General Laws Chapter 260, Section 31A, which requires if there's a condition on a piece of property that's going to uh, run with that land that they were required to file with the Registry of Deeds before 1964. Mr. Um, O'Connor, let me ask you this. Am I correct that the church twice approached uh, forgive me for using his first name, Waldo Maffey, about selling the property, and he refused? Uh, according to the record, Waldo Maffey did not refuse. He had to see if his brothers would go along. He had, and in fact, that was the issue, was going back to the brothers, and then finally it was the brothers wanted compensation for the uh, uh, sale of the property. So, so the issue was not whether or not it should be transferred. The issue was the original approach was, will you gift outright? Correct. Correct. And the intention was always to transfer the church. There wasn't, and that, that goes to the issue here of unjust enrichment, Your Honor. The intention was to give this, and we can talk about general charitable intent to the church, and that's much like the, the, the decision in the Hillman case where the uh, property was to be specifically used for St. Mary's for educational purposes. What the plaintiff would have happen here, Your Honor, is every charitable institution that takes a, uh, a deed for value of property is going to be subject to somebody coming back later and saying, no, no, I gifted that for a specific purpose. It's not in the deed, but we gave it, we sold it to you, but we also have this conditional gift that we're going to say is on oral. Mrs. Mrs. Maffey, with all due respect, uh, assigned her rights of dower and homestead to uh, uh, the diocese on the deed. She did so, and according to her own testimony, it was by the instruction of her husband. She didn't read the deed. Her husband was very intelligent in these types of business affairs, and she trusted her husband. Thank you, Mr. O'Connor. Thank you, Ron.